Hello everyone and welcome to my talk on our paper Shorter Non-Interactive Zero-Knowledge Arguments and Zaps for Algebraic Languages. My name is Dominic Hartmann and this is joint work with Jafar Couteau. So let me start by briefly recalling the setup for interactive proofs. We have Alice who wants to convince Bob of a statement and Alice knows a witness but she doesn't want to reveal it so she requires a zero-knowledge proof. And there are two types of zero-knowledge proofs. The first are interactive proofs which are often computationally very efficient and pretty well understood, but they have the disadvantage that Alice and Bob have to exchange multiple messages, so the latency between the messages is a major drawback, and both parties have to be present throughout the whole protocol, because these protocols generally aren't transferable, so only if the other party is present during the protocol, it actually believes the proof. So in many cases we want non-interactive zero-knowledge protocols, um, where Alice simply sends a single message, um, a single proof pi, and Bob is convinced even if he sees the proof later. The drawback of these protocols, of course, is that they don't exist in the plane model, so we require some trusted setup like a common reference string or the random oracle model, and they are often computationally way more expensive than interactive protocols, but since interactive protocols can't be used in all um, applications, for example in voting, they are not feasible, we often require non-interactive zero-knowledge, and we will focus on that in this paper. So, what are existing NISIC uh, constructions and why do we need another one? Well, first there were results that showed that non-interactive zero-knowledge exists for all of NP, however these generic constructions use uh, expensive NP reductions and don't yield efficient zero-knowledge, so we want to recap some efficient constructions. And the first one was the so-called Fiat-Shamir transformation from 87, which compiles a sigma protocol into a NISIC using a hash function which is modeled as a random oracle, and this yields very efficient uh, non-interactive protocols, almost as efficient as the underlying Sigma protocol, and security can be um, reduced to the properties of the underlying Sigma protocol, and since we can uh, compile all public coin constant round protocols, we can prove uh, all statements over NP. However, as I said, the hash function has to be modeled as a random oracle in order to get a security proof, so in the standard model this security is in a way heuristic, so we would like to avoid this. The first construction without random oracles was due to growth and Sahai, which allows us to prove statements over uh, pairing product equations, and it is secure in the standard model under the S68 assumption and also yields adaptive soundness. However, the efficiency is much worse than that of the Fiat-Tremier transformation, although still very much usable, and it is widely used and was extended in many follow-up papers, and is the, uh, I think, the most used zero-knowledge framework to date. Another line of work is uh, on the so-called quasi-adaptive NISICs, which for linear languages culminated in the work of Kills and Wee, which gave constant size proofs for linear languages in the standard model under the standard kernel matrix to the assumption, but as I said, only in a quasi-adaptive sense, so the common reference string they use may depend on the language, and their approach only works for linear languages, so a much smaller class than pairing product equations or even NP. So why do we need another framework for non-interactive zero-knowledge? As you can see, all constructions that we showed here have some kind of drawback. The Fiat-Shamir transformation requires the random oracle model in the proof, gross high proofs are quite inefficient compared to Fiat-Shamir, and the kills we proofs, although very efficient, only work for linear languages and only with quasi-adaptive soundness. So the question was, can we find something which is as efficient as the Fiat-Shamir transformation, secure in the standard model, so does not require random oracles, under some standard assumption with adaptive soundness for a larger class of languages than linear languages? And the answer is partially yes. In this work, we present a new compiler for interactive protocols, namely Sigma protocols, two uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge arguments that does not require random oracles in the security proof, has almost as good efficiency as the Fiat-Shamir transformation, adaptive soundness and works for the class of algebraic languages, which is uh, considerably, considerably bigger than the class of linear languages and is secure under a new assumption which we call the extended kernel matrix diffie hellman assumption, which is a natural extension of the uh, regular kernel matrix diffie hellman assumption. So, what is the idea of our compiler? As I said, we start with a Sigma protocol and want to compile it into a NISIC. So this is a Sigma protocol over an abelian group. We have a word which is a, a group element vector and the witness is a ZP vector. 
The first flow is a group vector as well. The challenge from the verifier is just a random ZP element and the response is a ZP vector. And now we want to compile this into a non-interactive zero-knowledge argument. So we somehow have to eliminate this one flow from, from the verifier to the prover. And the most simple way would be, okay, we simply choose E as the common reference string and both parties have access to it and can simply non-interactively um, compute the proof and also verify it. However, this uh, sadly doesn't work since it breaks the soundness of the protocol. Because the property of a Sigma protocol uh, one of them is the special honest verifier zero knowledge, with, which says that if we know the challenge and a statement which does not need to be in the language, then there is a simulator which produces an accepting transcript, so an A and a D, which is accepting even though X is not in the language. So we can't make it as easy as simply giving um, E to the prover in advance. However, we somehow have to eliminate it. And this is where our core idea comes from. And instead of giving E in the clear, we simply give it to a different group. So instead of giving E as the CRS, we give G2 to the E for some generator G2 of a group. Now, X is in a different group than E. And if the two uh, groups have a, an asymmetric pairing, then verification still is possible, since most Sigma protocols have a linear verification equation and all the protocols that we consider will have such an equation. So correctness in this compiled protocol simply holds due to a pairing. Of course, the second flow of the prover now also has to be in group G2, since it depends on the challenge, which is now only um, present in group G2 as well. We can also easily see that this uh, construction is zero knowledge, because as I said, if uh, the prover had E in the clear, it could simply compute A and D without knowing a witness. So this is exactly a simulation trapdoor. Now, if we give the simulator E, he can, um, he can uh, use the uh, special honest verifier simulator of the underlying Sigma protocol, and the proof is convincing. The two interesting questions here are whether this construction is sound, and if so, for which languages? And um, since the compiler itself is really simple, those two questions are the main contribution of our work. And um, as I told you in the beginning, it will work for the so-called algebraic languages and sounds will hold relative to our new extended kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption. But before I get into the specifics, let me give you a brief intuition on why soundness should hold and why not for more than algebraic languages. The intuition for soundness is as follows. We have E in group G2, but we have to compute a vector A in group G1 which has a non-trivial relation to this E, because this is exactly what normally the special honest verifier zero knowledge simulator would do, because for X not in the language, there simply isn't that, uh, aren't that many options for choosing A. But since we have the one thing, namely the challenge in group G2, but have to compute A in group G1, this should be hard because there should not be too much connection between the two groups other than the pairing, but that only gives us group elements in the target group, which also should help us find something in group G1. And this is also where the restriction to algebraic languages come from, because algebraic languages only live over a single group. However, if we would have something like pairing product equations, where the language is over group G1 and G2, then this split between the challenge being hidden in one group and the first flow, which is in the same group as the statement, being in group G1, simply doesn't hold anymore. Because now this first flow is in group G1 and G2, or even in group GT, and then this whole divide between challenge and uh, commitment doesn't hold anymore, and we don't know how to show soundness. So that's it for intuition. Now let's get more into the technical details. And for that, I'll start with some notation. As I said, we'll be using uh, asymmetric pairing groups. So we have three groups, G1, G2, and GT, with respective generators. And instead of writing gi to the x, I'll use implicit notation and write x in brackets with subscript i. Vectors will be lowercase bold font letters and matrices will be uppercase bold font letters. And pairings will be denoted by this dot. And of course, um, pairings and implicit notation directly um, translates to vectors and matrices. So a matrix vector product in the uh, appropriate groups can be expressed via pairings. So let's start with defining what algebraic languages actually are. 
And an intuition is that uh, these are the languages described by polynomial relationships between exponents in an abelian group. So, for example, Elgamal encryptions of a bit are an algebraic language, but also d squared Diffie-Hellman language. So, whether uh, we have g, g to the x, and g to the x squared, or g, g to the x, and g to the z for some random uh, z. And formally, these languages can be described by a language matrix function and a target vector function, which both take the word as input and then output a matrix and a target vector. Any word is in the language if its target vector is in the image of its language matrix. So this already looks very similar to linear languages. And exactly, uh, linear languages are a subset of these algebraic languages if we simply set the language matrix function as a constant matrix and the target vector as the identity function. So we can already see that this is uh, more versatile than linear languages. And indeed, it has the nice property that algebraic languages are closed under conjunction and disjunction. So the disjunction of two algebraic languages is in itself, again, an algebraic language. So we get OR proofs basically for free. Another property that we can define for algebraic languages is the so-called witness sampleability, which means that this uh, language matrix function can be sampled together with a trapdoor, which allows us to check language membership. This property originally comes from uh, linear languages, where this language trapdoor is simply um, a vector in the kernel of the language matrix. So if we multiply a potential um, element in the language with this kernel vector, it is cancelled. And if it is not in the language, then it is a non-zero vector. So it indeed allows us to check language membership. However, for algebraic languages, it won't be as clear what this trapdoor exactly is, because such a vector in the kernel of the language matrix for every x generally simply won't exist or won't be computable. So um, we can't uh, define it exactly the same as for linear languages, but in the spirit it is the same and uh, can be reasonably defined. And an example for a witness sampleable algebraic languages would indeed be the Elgamal encryption of a bit, where simply the public, uh, the secret key, sorry, would be exactly this trapdoor. Um, and allowed us to check it. However, for square Diffie-Hellman languages, it isn't clear what this trapdoor would exactly be, especially if it has to be um, word independent, because how can we check whether we have uh, a square triple or not? So not all algebraic languages are witness sampleable, but many interesting ones actually are. And to make it explicit once more, as I already told you, linear languages are a real subset of algebraic languages which themselves are a subset of pairing product equations, which we can prove with Grosse High, because uh, as you can see, algebraic languages are only defined over a single group, while pairing product equations um, span all three groups of an asymmetric pairing. So of course, they are more uh, versatile than what we have here. OK, so we want to apply our compiler to algebraic languages. And for that, we need a Sigma protocol for algebraic languages. And this we get by instantiating the framework of Maura. And the resulting Sigma protocol looks as follows. The prover starts with a random image under the language matrix for the word he wants to prove a statement over, uh, gets a random ZP element as a challenge, and its response is the scaled witness um, blinded by the randomness used in the first step. And you can see the verification equation is indeed linear in the challenge. So simply by replacing the regular multiplication with pairings, we can still verify. And indeed, this is exactly what we do. We move E in group G2 to the CRS. D is now also in group G2, and all the regular multiplication is now replaced by pairings. And you can see easily that correctness holds. And as I told you before, if we give our simulator E in ZP and not in G2 as a simulation trapdoor, we can use the underlying special honest verifier simulator to show zero knowledge. The open question is, how can we prove soundness? And for that, as I already told you, we want to exploit that E and A have to have a non-trivial relationship and reduce this to a new assumption. And this new assumption is the so-called extended kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption, which as the name implies is an extension of the kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption. So next, I'll show you what this kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption is, why it is insufficient to prove soundness in this case, and then show you our extension and why this is actually sufficient to show soundness. 
But first, since you now know what algebraic languages are and already know the name of the assumption, I can show you the main theorem of our paper. And this is as follows. If we have uh, a language matrix function M and a target vector function theta, which describe an algebraic language, and we have pairing groups, then the compiled sigma protocol from the slide before is indeed a non-interactive zero-knowledge argument for the language. Namely, it is perfectly correct, perfectly zero-knowledge, and if the extended kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption holds relative to the pairing groups, then the protocol is also computationally sound. So, let's get to the kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption. It was introduced by Murilla, Raffles and Villa, and it is pretty simple. The adversary gets as its challenge a matrix D from some matrix distribution in group G2 and has to answer with a vector C in group G1, which has to be in the left kernel of this matrix. And this is already in a, uh, in a similar flavor to what I told you is what we need. We want the adversary to give us something in the opposite group of the challenge with a non-trivial relation to this challenge. And as it turns out, this uh, kernel matrix of Hellman assumption is already sufficient to prove soundness for linear languages. Because if we have a linear language with some trapdoor T, which as I told you cancels these, uh, this matrix M from the left, then we can simply look at the verification equation and apply the trapdoor. So we multiply it from the left and uh, by definition this M vanishes, so the left side is zero. However, if the adversary actually produce, produced a proof for something not in the language, then um, this X and this A won't cancel. And if we, we uh, rearrange this a bit, then we can see the left side as a vector C and have a solution for the kernel matrix diffie hellman assumption uh, for the language one e, uh, for the uh, language matrix one e, and we have a reduction to this uh, assumption. So why doesn't this work for algebraic languages? The problem comes with the trapdoor. For linear languages, we can find trap, uh, a trapdoor which cancels the matrix M. However, for uh, algebraic languages, this in general won't be possible because now M depends on the word. And since to use the trapdoor in the way we do it here, the trapdoor has to be over ZP because otherwise we would have to use the pairing at the point of multiplying T with A and X, and then we couldn't use the pairing in the end. And the solution would be in the wrong group because it would already be in group GT. So we need a trapdoor over ZP, which somehow would have to depend on the vector X but X is over group G1, so in order to compute this trapdoor, which cancels M for every X, it would have to depend on X, and this is in general not possible. So in order to cope with this freedom of the adversary to choose X and in this sense uh, manipulate this matrix M of X, we have to also give the adversary more freedom in the assumption. And this is exactly what we do in the extended kernel matrix diffie hellman assumption. And that looks as follows. Now we make it a bit easier for the adversary to find uh, elements in the kernel of the matrix by allowing him to add rows to this matrix. So he gets to add L rows, but in order to keep the assumption non-trivial, he also has to give us L plus one vectors in the kernel of this new um, matrix. And these vectors have to be linearly independent in order to keep the assumption non-trivial. And this L is now a parameter of the assumption, so the bigger L gets the more uh, linearly independent kernel vectors the adversary has to give us. Formally, we can say that this matrix C times D combined with B has to be zero and the rank of C has to be at least L plus one. So why is this a reasonable assumption to make at all? Well, first of all, it is in a way a natural extension of the kernel matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption. We give the adversary more freedom by allowing him to extend its challenge, but in order to win, he has to also give us more. It is also a static and non-interactive assumption, and we've shown that it holds in the generic and algebraic group model. The problem comes in with falsifiability. In order to, for a solution to be a valid solution, the rank of this matrix C has to be at least L plus 1. However, this won't be checkable in general for a uh, matrix of group vectors. So the assumption in general is not falsifiable. However, for a large class of useful languages, it actually can be falsifiable, namely for the class of witness sampleable algebraic languages, because we have this trapdoor which allows us to check language membership. And this can be used as follows. Again, we look at the verification equation already multiplied by the trapdoor T, which now does not cancel M of X, and having put uh, T times M of X 
paired with the on the right side. And if we rewrite this again in the same way as we did for the linear case, we get this matrix C, which is in the kernel of 1E combined with D. So this D is now the extension that the adversary uses, and this is hopefully a solution. And we can actually show that the rank of C is full and in a sense visible, if and only if this word X is not in the language. So in exactly this case, we get a reduction to our extended kernel matrix if you have an assumption. The visibility of the rank in this case means that we can bring this matrix C in an upper triangular form without computing any uh, anything like uh, CDH, so we can check the rank. Note that, uh, of course, we also get a reduction to the assumption for uh, non witness sampleable languages. However, then the assumption is non-falsifiable. However, this non-falsifiability is not in a knowledge assumption flavor, but more in a gap assumption flavor, which one can think of as something like saying that DDH in group G2 is still hard even if we had a CDH oracle in group G1. But this is only as an intuition. So let's conclude this talk by comparing our results with uh, some existing ones, namely with the ones I told you about in the beginning. And for the case of linear languages and more concretely for DDH, we can see that our construction is more efficient than gross to high in proof size, where we save one group element, as well as in number of pairings, where we save three quarters of the pairings that gross to high needs, which is quite a lot. However, we are not as efficient as the kills we proofs, since they yield constant size proofs and smaller ones, and they need less pairings. However, our proofs are fully adaptive, while theirs are only quasi-adaptive. And the assumption is actually a sound one because we uh, are secure under the same assumption as the kills we proofs, which is the standard kernel matrix diffie Hellman assumption for linear languages. And the efficiency improvements compared to gross high also hold in the uh, general case for linear languages. So also asymptotically, we improve over gross high in uh, proof size as well as pairing number. Another interesting fact is that to the best of our knowledge, our framework yields the first proofs which are fully adaptive but leverage witness sampleability. So we close the gap between gross high and kills we, since the first uh, is fully adaptive and does not use witness sampleability, while the kills we proofs are both uh, quasi adaptive and one does not use witness sampleability while the other does. So it is a nice completion in a sense. Another important applications are all proofs. Um, and they are the most prominent uh, and most used uh, or proof is the one by Raffles, which is an application of the gross high framework. And again, for the or of two DDH languages, uh, we will start. And there, the proof size of the uh, existing proofs are 10 group elements and they require 24 pairings, while we only need uh, seven group elements and 12 pairings. So a uh, huge efficiency improvement, of course, at the cost of assuming our new extended kernel matrix to the assumption and also using witness sampleability, which for DDH is a given. And this also, of course, extends to general languages described by an n times t matrix and an n2 times t2 matrix. Note that these do not have to be the same, so this is a really flexible construction. And there as well, the efficiency improvements hold asymptotically. So what are some applications of our new uh, OR proof? Um, there are many, and some include the tightly secure structure preserving signature constructions, simulation sound quasi adaptive, NISIX, ring signatures, and many more. And for many of these applications, the OR proof is actually a large part of their size and computation. And by reducing its size, we can uh, significantly improve the size of the primitives in which they are used. So by assuming our new assumption, we can greatly improve many primitives. So this is at least something to consider. So that's it for my talk. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll gladly answer them at the panel discussion and uh, I'll gladly see you then. Bye.